Frank, you have been with UPS for 32 years now. Um, you have led the business in several countries. Now you're leading the German business. Uh, what would you say are the most important milestones in your career with UPS? Well, UPS is a, you know, it's a marvelous company, and I had the fortune to join it at a time of phenomenal expansion back in 1986, where the business in Germany was doubling, I think, almost every year. There are an incredible amount of opportunities available for someone who wanted to take them, and I did. And so I had the chance to see a lot of things and learn a lot of things very quickly. I would say the first real big eye-opener for me was uh, being sent to work in Cologne as the controller, which was the airport, our big operation there, but also responsibility for Eastern Europe right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So I, got, you know, I was in Russia before you know, setting up joint ventures. It was a very, very exciting time. I think that was the thing that really made me think, wow, this is really global and I can be part of it. Great. Britta, you have also been with the company for several years. Um, a, a UPS driver in general stays in the company for about 14 years on average. What is so special about the company as an employer? Oh, you know, I think um, the majority of our people does not really join with the intention to stay for such a long time. But what you get used to very, very soon is our very broad culture and especially this familiar atmosphere we have uh, with each other. So um, the logistics sector is a very hands on um, industry and we really live this and are excited about this what also means that um, we show up in our facilities very very frequently so you will see Frank several times um, in, in our operations getting in touch with the drivers um, and I think that this makes a big big difference especially in a big enterprise where you're usually not used to the fact that you know your Germany CEO um, or comparable people. Frank, you, you have been in a leading, leading function at UPS for, for many years. You also are the president of the American Chamber of Commerce, so you are surrounded by leaders all of the time. What is a great leader from your point of view? Well, I think there's a, a couple of characteristics that any great leader must have. One is certainly integrity. I mean, people very quickly realize, you know, if their leader exhibits the characteristics he expects from them, right? So you have to be believable and uh, really live what you expect others to do. And I think also very importantly is to be able to communicate a vision. People need to know, one, why they're important, no matter what job they're doing. And secondly, why what they're doing is essential for the mission succeeding. And that at UPS is uh, with, you know, there's 450,000 employees worldwide, 20,000 in Germany. That's a real challenge. We need to make sure that everyone understands that what they're doing is going to be essential to making our business flourish. And that, I think, is probably the single biggest thing a leader has to look at. Okay. What's, what do you think? Um, I think the m most important skill of a great leader is that you have the ability to inspire others. Um, and this helps you in two ways. First of all, when you are able to inspire others, you help them to grow and to learn more and to dream bigger, um, what then also in results in career opportunities which some people don't even see they are you know, able to perform and grow into at the beginning. And secondly, I also think, you know, somebody who inspires other needs to care about the small things. Um, these are not the people you see holding an elevated talk, uh, just asking how are you and still continuing their walk. These are really the people who are closely connected and honestly connected to their teams. In human resources, which will be the, the most important bottlenecks for recruitment in the next five to ten years? Um, I think one very crucial point is the shortage of skilled labor, right? We are all facing already now. There is a big generation upcoming which will retire very soon. 
Um, we have a growing economy, luckily, and we will have the need to, to have the workforce performing this. I still believe that technology will help us um, also to overcome partially these issues. So, um, but it is really about having a qualified workforce and retain this workforce because the war for talent will become much, much bigger. Besides the human factor, technology is changing the business, every business, and our personal environment. For UPS, what are the top three priorities that are triggered by the change of technology? Well, uh, you know, our priorities are not set by what technologies are available. They're set by what we're trying to do as a company, right? Which is connect intelligent networks throughout the world you know, that meshes very well with the direction technology is going. And for us, technology means, uh, one, UPS has always been a big data company. We deliver 20 million shipments a day. We have incredible amounts of data. So that plays right into the whole concept of big data and data analytics. And, uh, you know, as more and more devices come online, there's more and more information available that will help us be more efficient, you know, provide even higher quality, and also very important to us to keep our people safe. Those are key priorities. At the same time, uh, you know, we're betting that artificial intelligence is going to be a big thing in the future, uh, you know, machine learning, and I think autonomous vehicles, automation our facilities there's an entire universe of things out there that quite frankly you have to keep your eyes on to see which of those pieces are going to help you at what point so it's a very exciting time you know to be doing what we do which is physical we move things right but at the same time you want to connect to the entire digitalization of everything and when we get that right when the digital and the physical really are meshed in our global network that's when we deliver the incredible value that our customers want and expect from us. Talking about disruptive methods um, and tools, blockchain is on everyone's minds. What is your stance uh, on that topic and what are you working on? Well, uh, blockchain is very important for us. I'm not sure if I'd put it in the category of disruptive because what it's really going to do is It'll be disruptive in the sense that it's going to have such a massive influence on existing processes, right? And, uh, you know, we're connecting people all over the world. Blockchain can add an essential element of trust between people that really have no reason to trust each other, right? And that will enable us to do even more, more quickly. One thing that we're working on very, uh, you know, to be very precise is uh, in the area of customs clearance. We're part, we're part of an alliance that's trying to implement blockchain into that to eliminate all the paper and all the things that currently have to be done to clear packages when you move from one economic area to another. That's just one example. We really believe very firmly that blockchain is going to help us become more efficient, but more importantly, help people trade more easily with each other throughout the world. In your personal opinion, how will city logistics and last mile solutions um, look like in 10 years? Well, firstly, if we look at uh, the amount of parcels that are being shipped and delivered today <clears throat> and compare ourselves to the U.S. or more dramatically to China, you can see that the percentage of online retail in Germany and in Europe is significantly lower. So when you talk about all the packages that are out there, guess what? They're going to double, triple, maybe even quadruple, right? So the challenges become also bigger. Uh, we're working on a lot of solutions. You know, we have issues. The world has issues with sustainability, congestion. Uh, those are all things that we think we can very positively impact. We have a lot of solutions out there already where we deliver parts of cities using bicycles or on foot by bringing packages in larger vehicles, planning them somewhere, and basing people in those areas. And we're looking continually at ways to make sure that people are there where the package is going to be. You know, as uh, people are going to emit more data, we already do through our mobile phones, but in the future, you know, mobile phone will talk maybe to the UPS delivery device and we'll know where those two are going to meet. I think there's going to be a lot of exciting solutions out there 
that will help enable and empower all of this. And quite frankly, there has to be, because if the number of deliveries doubles and we haven't come up with a way to be you know, a lot more efficient in managing that flow, there'll be problems. So it's a challenge we accept and are confident we will meet. And what does that mean for HR? Oh, you know, I think um, people are looking for an employer they can be proud of. And this also means that you have an employer who takes a social responsibility. I'm quite confident that the city logistics solutions will be very sustainable and with that really link um, between the expectations um, regarding us as an employer and the need of our customers. And I think there are great opportunities ahead for our people. Yeah? You see it now with the bicycle drivers. Um, it is nice if you don't have to drive a car every single day, if you can swap with your peers from time to time, using the bike, doing something for your health. And also with all the technology that will come into place, it is a an, an very exciting time where you can advance, gain additional knowledge, and then really use it and, and maybe, you know, we will have big crowds of programmers, IT folks really inventing um, and defining the world of logistics in the future. The U.S. market is still advanced uh, regarding online business models and fulfillment abilities. Where do you think might the European market have advantage, advantages and opportunities to be maybe stronger than the, than the U.S. market? Well, people, you know, all over the world, people are creative. As we speak right now, there's people all over the place working on startups that are going to, you know, make things better. I think, however, the U.S. certainly has an advantage in, you know, glorifying that culture without stifling it. And every time I hear about a new initiative in Germany, we're going to make this by doing that, that's not the way it works. I and mean, anyone who's been to Silicon Valley knows that isn't the way it works. But the other thing you learn, if you go to Silicon Valley, it's not Americans. There's people there from all over the world, right? There's a lot of Germans there in key positions. So it's not so much where someone comes from, but what freedom they're given to develop solutions. And I think we need to take a step back and think a little, you know, Germany particularly has a strong desire to not have uncertainty or surprises and it has served us extremely well, right? We're an engineering company, we make incremental changes, we have to let go and just think, okay, we can also do disruptive stuff because we have incredibly talented people here and I think particularly for Germany, one of the big advantages uh, at least as a manufacturing company country, is the solid employee base and the training systems. We need to combine that a little bit more with uh, you know an injection of Silicon Valley, and I think we could have a very very powerful model for here. On the contrary, if we don't do that, we're going to see you know tech companies from the U.S. and China just divide up everything among themselves, and we certainly don't want that. Younger generations, that is Generation Y and Z, don't care so much about the big names of the big companies. Mm -hmm. What is needed to attract the best talent of young people to big companies? You know, I think you really need to be an employer who cares. Um, nobody wants to be just a number, an anonym number in a brick enterprise organization. You know, I'm just one of... 440,000, so this is not how it works. Um, so we will always be able to attract the right talent for us with our attitude to really include new employees um, into the team and really care about what they want to develop, you know, where they see themselves in the next three to five years and then help them to grow and to advance. We have a very strong culture from promotion with, from within. Um, and, and this gives a lot of opportunity and I think this is what really Gen Y and everybody is, is looking for and then also a bit more flexibility than the you know traditional 
enterprise currently provides. We are currently piloting a model where you work three weeks and then you have a week off and you're still on a, on a full-time contract just working a bit more through the first three weeks of the month. And I think these are the models and there's not a one-fits-all solution. It is really about offering the right puzzle um, to attract the people we need.